Tech Time Traveler here and welcome to another unfridging video, which is our fancy way of saying it's show and tell time. I can't believe it's been almost a year already since our last unfridging video. In that time, I've been scouring the world looking for interesting pieces to collect. Actually, I haven't collected as much as I used to. For one thing, after 20 years of this, I have some space issues. Plus, things are getting a little expensive. Wow. And then, there's so many varieties of vintage computers. Like, you never just stop finding interesting stuff to want. And the more you get, the more you find. It's almost kind of an epidemic, I think, among certain members of a certain demographic group I'm a part of. Sometimes I wonder, is this, you know, becoming a problem? Frankly, I've just been trying to work with what I've got. With over 300 vintage machines in my possession, something is always breaking, and thus something is always needing fixing. But anyway, here's a few items I thought were worthy of note. You'll be seeing most of them in their own videos in due time. You know, once I finish fixing stuff. Okay, so our first item is a $10 ThinkPad 510CS. Now a quick look at it will tell you <laughs> why it was only 10 bucks. Starting with the Velcro attached all over the place. Uh, then proceeding to the broken bottom here. Um, I do actually have the door for this, but it doesn't stay in place anymore because it's missing the, whatever it latches onto. You know, it's, uh, yeah, this is falling off. And we're missing the door here and it doesn't work. And the screen is cracked. So even if it did work, it wouldn't work. So yeah, it, you might be wondering, you know, why is a guy who collects a lot of stuff from the 70s interested in ThinkPads? The reason for that is just because it's one of those things that I grew up with. Uh, my dad brought home this very ThinkPad. This is a 760 EL back in 1994. And it's one of the few computers from my quote unquote childhood that I still have. This one's been changed a little bit. Uh, when we got it, it had that horrible dual scan screen and uh, the keyboard's been replaced because the original keyboard died. But the base, the hard drive, everything in it is the original computer that my dad brought home one day. And compared to the absolute tanks that came before it, like the Toshiba T-Series, this thing looked thoroughly modern. You know, everything about it, just the look of it, the feel of it, you know, how square they are. The clinky clink noise that the hard drive makes when it's working. Yeah, it was just such a, a unique thing and, and to have color. But yeah, that was mind-blowingly good for its day. So ever since then, I've always just kind of, you know, quietly gone after ThinkPads when I can get them cheaply. I don't spend top dollar on them. And I do kind of limit myself to the first few years, you know, some of the key ones. Um, I have one of the butterfly keyboard units. Now I have this little guy and I have another one that I'm going to show you that I bought at the same time as this one. But yeah, this looks like it must have been a pretty nice little machine to work with. I mean, it is absolutely tiny compared to the 760EL, which I thought was tiny when my dad brought it home compared to the other laptops. I mean, look at the size difference between those two. <laughs> yeah, I'd way rather have this on my lap than this. But uh, yeah, it's quite bagged. You know, the thing with these earlier ThinkPads, they're becoming quite scarce. They really don't come up that often. And I bought this one just because it was cheap. It might serve as a source of parts if I can find another one, or it might just, you know, sit on display. That's probably what most of these things are gonna do. I did try powering it up, just in case you're curious. It does not get any kind of power whatsoever. Probably something's broken inside. But you know, even if it just sits on a shelf beside my 701C and my 730T, you know, that's that's good enough for me. You know, I, I'm not, this isn't the kind of thing that I'm typically gonna be using every day. I have a perfectly good 380XD if I wanna do any kind of gaming. And of course the 760 still works, so yeah. But it's just a cool little laptop. The, the keyboard is tiny. <laughs> no butterfly here, although it might've been useful. That's the trackpad. The weird thing on this one is the buttons, but it almost kind of makes sense that way, doesn't it? Because this is how you could typically use it. It's a little more comfortable than doing it that way. But the other thing that strikes me about it is just how plain it is. I mean, it's basically just a rectangle. Uh, it doesn't have any of the rubberized coating. 
doesn't have the fancy indicator lights inside or any of the other adornments doesn't have speakers you know it's just just a very basic little sub notebook i think these were called sub notebooks i'm not sure if it's sub notebook or ultra portable but yeah you know if i ever find a screen i might be inclined to open it up and see if i can figure out why it's not getting power and in the meantime i'm just happy to have it on display you know something i can walk by and do that <laughs> every once in a while all right here's the next one Ugh. they call it a portable but man it doesn't feel that way at 46. so this is a toshiba t5100 portable computer i believe it dates to around 1987 and this machine has a very special meaning to me because we actually had one of these when i was a kid and I discovered one day by accident that it had 16 color EGA graphics. We had it for probably about a year before I realized that. And in the meantime, I had been suffering along on our family's 5170, which had the four color hell called CGA. And yeah, this was, um, when I discovered this, it was quite by accident. I was installing a mouse driver and I noticed that the, just at the top, it said EGA connected and I went, what? EGA? And of course I realized, hey, I can plug into this RGB port here and this might be EGA and now I can have 16 colors when I'm playing my Sierra games or whatever. I was particularly interested with Sierra games because I had had 16 colors years before when we had our PC Junior and I was playing King's Quest on that. And then we went to the PC and all the other machines that didn't. And playing a Sierra game in four colors is a nightmare because there's just, you can't see certain things because they're completely camouflaged by the sea of yellow and blue, which was the usual palette uh, most of those games used. So yeah, I, I do actually have a few other Toshiba T-Series machines in my collection. Now this one, we can see it's missing the plastic cover here. But yeah, let's have a look at it here. Now, full confession, this isn't the first time I looked at this machine. I actually uh, fired it up earlier because I was just so eager to see it after 30 something years. And uh, I discovered right away that it wasn't booting up, which was kind of problematic. But I expected that these old low capacity hard drives are dying at a pretty steady clip, unfortunately, and that's just sort of the way it is. So. I kind of didn't resist temptation. I immediately ripped the thing apart and got the hard drive out. And that's when I discovered um, when I would power the machine on, I would get basically just this weird beep, 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 beep kind of noise from the hard drive, which usually means it's dead. And I hooked it up to my Pentium 3 testbed computer and I kind of played around with it a bit. If I just kind of shook it like this, it suddenly would work and it would just spin up. Then I tried to do an F-disc on it, but when I did that, the drive would crash. It would basically make these bizarre noises. And then it would shut down and nothing else would happen. Now that probably should have been my cue to, yeah, this thing is dead, but I'm kind of stubborn. And I thought, you know, maybe it's just sticking because it's been sitting for a long time. So I just kept doing it over and over again. And eventually I got the machine to actually F-disc and no problem, I was able to create a partition. I was able to format it. There were no bad sectors. Everything worked. I copied some basic DOS files over, but my computer, my test bed would not boot off of it. It kept saying invalid media and I'd have to reformat it again. And my hunch is that that's probably because the P3 is a little bit too new for that drive. I know it's IDE and IDE should be compatible all the way across, but something wasn't going right. I don't know if it was maybe the way the BIOS was detecting the drive. It wasn't setting up the head cylinders and sectors properly. I figured, you know, worst comes to worst, nah, I'll just give up on it and I'll boot off a floppy disk. I just wanna see uh, some games that I remember playing on the original hardware that I used to play on. Here it is. Overall, it's not in bad shape. I mean, it's got some dings. The screen is not broken, which with these is absolutely crucial because you cannot find replacements for those if they're cracked or damaged or they have lines through them. That's kind of it, they're gas plasma. I guess you could potentially rig something else up if you really wanted to, but it would just spoil the the look and the design of the machine for me because I remember it as the, the amber plasma color. Cosmetically, it's not bad. We've got a little keyboard plug in here, the full size AT connector. We've got a switch that, I forget exactly how this works. I think it changes the printer port to a floppy disk or something like that. And uh, then we got our RGB parallel dip switches, which I guess determine 
what characteristics the graphics card is using. Hopefully this is set to EGA because that's all I really want. And then we have a COM port for mouse. And of course we have this slot in the back, which most of these Toshiba portables had uh, any number of peripherals. Usually a modem would be the thing that you would put in there. And then on the side we have the floppy drive. Uh, I don't know whose these were. They might actually be Toshiba's, but I, they have a distinct sound to them, which I always makes me feel kind of nostalgic. Uh, yeah, the screen's a little bit dirty. Uh, I think I'm gonna fix that because that's just gonna bug me. I'll just, uh... Okay, so we got her set up. Let's see what happens. Here it goes. Oh my God, it actually worked. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, here we go. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh man, this is really bringing back some memories. Look at that. And you know, if I'd had another uh, Toshiba laptop with CGA graphics to compare to, I would have noticed the difference. Because even though they share the same red plasma screen, um, there is a difference in the graphic quality because obviously CGA, they do more, I guess, dithering or whatever to make up for the lack of colors. Whereas this is really nice and sharp and smooth. I'm gonna have to uh, hook it up to my 5154 again, just to have that nostalgic <laughs> feel. I'll set up the ATE and then I'll run the cable from the 5154 to this and then uh, use it just like I did back in the day. Okay, now for the next thing, I know I said I try not to buy x86 machines because they just take up too much room and you really only need a few representative examples to have pretty much every era covered. But every now and again, I come across something like this. And yeah, this is the DataView Snap One Plus One. And the thing that caught my attention about this was these two pieces actually are supposed to separate from each other. This is like a dock. And this is basically the head end of the computer. And you're supposed to be able to take it off and basically use it independently of this on, uh, on battery or whatever. I just thought that was really cool. Um, it looks like a pretty decent laptop. We've got an expansion slot there that looks to be, looks like an 8-bit ISA. Well, it's not too bad. I don't know what that port's for. Probably an external floppy. And then we've got two power ports, which is weird. We've got this big DIN connector here. Uh, it looks like one, two, three, six, eight pins. And then uh, that guy. I'm gonna need to find the manual to find out what exactly that does. Now I do have the main power supply, which is this thing right here. It's enormous brick uh, and it's got the DIN connector on it. So yeah, just plugs in like that. And uh, let's see here, I'll spin it around. And then we've got our RGB connection and printer port and we've got our power switch. Uh, I'm not really seeing the snap aspect of this though because like these look like you got to unscrew them basically to get the thing apart yeah like it, I don't think it actually like snaps the way the name implies it's kind of a deceptive advertising type deal okay let's open it up here well, that's interesting uh, screen's a little whack. Um, looks like it's got some streaks or something in it there. I've seen that on other laptops. I don't know what causes it other than scratching, like it's been dragged across something, but I wouldn't imagine that you would drag it across. Um, yeah, the keys are... Um, they're kind of easy to press, which is nice. They, they do feel a little bit cheap, but... And you have a full numeric keypad up here, which is something that uh, you didn't see very often on these laptops or really any laptops until much later on. It advertises 10 megahertz, but I believe it's an 80C88 CPU that's in there. It's not a uh, 
286 as far as I know. And yeah, this is supposedly a backlit screen, which definitely would be a one-up on some of the other machines that were out at the time with the non-backlit blue LCDs that you just could not see <laughs> to save your life. Uh, in terms of what it came with, well, it came with a bag, which I'm not gonna show because it's just a bag. And then it came with a bunch of five and a quarter inch floppy disks that look like they've been in a flood of some sort. And then it came with some uh, Symantec Q&A floppy disk, startup disk, intelligent assistant, write proof, and tutorial samples. So yeah, let's plug it in. We'll see, see if it does anything. I'm very doubtful, but let's see. Oh, oh, it lights up. I've got a line through the screen. Is there anything happening here? Oh, I'm just adjusting the contrast. <laughs> it's just barely there. I don't know if you can see that, but it says RAM disk will be erased. Yeah, okay, I don't care. It's a RAM disk. Main memory. Yeah, the contrast is totally gacked on this. 616K extended memory. Battery level is okay. Yeah, I don't think so. Use the plus. Okay, now it's, now it's rebooting. It's trying to do something. Oh, there's a config program. Hit R to reconfigure the system. Uh, this is really hard. RAM disk is active. Do not boot from RAM disk. Uh, two floppy disks attached, obviously no. You know what, I'm gonna borrow the boot disk that I had for the Toshiba, and we'll see if it'll actually work. No, it's not recognizing anything. Okay, well, that'll be a, a project for another video. But yeah, that's the snap. I don't know what the snap part of it is. Cause like I said, I don't see any way to detach the back end here unless you unscrew this. And that just doesn't seem very snappy or convenient. Okay, our next contender is this AT&T, uh, what is it called? 1300 video transaction terminal. Manufactured in October of 1985. Ooh, it has these little feet on it. Look at that, kind of snazzy. So this is basically a video text terminal that AT&T offered in partnership, I think with one or two banks. Uh, and it was the typical video text deal where you got the machine for not very much money, even though these things are quite expensive to produce. And they basically buried the cost into a monthly payment. And you could do some equivalent of online banking in 1985. Uh, obviously not as advanced as what we have today with the you know, ability to transfer stuff around and, uh, and photo deposit and stuff like that. But still kind of a neat thing to think that this was available in, in 1985. We got a power button, we have a phone and a line jack. We have a weird proprietary looking connector for a printer. And then we have a five pin DIN connector for video. And then we have power. Now the keyboard is right under here. And there you go. Uh, not a bad feel to it. It's kind of, uh, it's a little bit, I don't know what the word is, spongy. Now you can see the little AT&T logo down there. I did fire it up upstairs uh, in my bedroom where I have a little CRT TV just to see what it did. And it does work. Um, unfortunately, there's nowhere to go with it because there's no service. You know, the service that this belonged to is long gone. And uh, I don't really have any other dial-up services. I imagine it might have been able to dial up like a bulletin board maybe because it does give you the ability to add other phone numbers. So. I don't know if they have to be specifically video text or if you could use a text-based BBS maybe. Yeah, I, I collect these things. I just think they're really neat because it's kind of the internet before the internet. 
Um, all these companies were trying to get people online, but they didn't have a true internet where everything was linked together, you know, from coast to coast or whatever. All of these services existed as their own little islands. So it would be like if you had a Gmail account and you wanted to email your grandmother who has a Yahoo account, but you can't because you have to have a Yahoo account to email somebody with a Yahoo account. Like it's, it's that kind of thing. And of course the cost of these things, any kind of computer hardware in the eighties was crazy expensive. And being that the eighties were so analog, most people wouldn't see the need for this. So the only way something like this would become viable is if it had a particularly compelling service like banking and or they buried the cost of the machine in your monthly payment. And the monthly payments for your stuff like this could typically range uh, anywhere from 40 to $80 a month, which in 1984, $85, yeah, it's like a hundred plus dollars a month now. <laughs> so most people, you know, they would take the free trial that was offered usually with these things and then they would kind of send it back because the eighties were still very, very analog in spite of how computery they seem to us. But yeah, that's a cool little box. It's 20 bucks. I have several other terminals like this and I'm hoping to do a video on video text machines. Uh, Cause I just find the whole concept kind of fascinating. I've been gathering up research and physical props to show, and I'm trying to figure out if I can devise some kind of a server to feed these things so you can actually see what they're capable of doing. All right, this next one's gonna be kind of an actual unboxing uh, because I wanted to save this box because it is the original box that this came in. This is a VersaWriter. This is a digitizing tablet for the Apple II. It was one of the very first ones that was available. And uh, yeah, this is the box apparently that it came in unless uh, they transferred the label and that stamp over, but I don't think so. They made this for a few different computers. I think they had it for the Apple. Uh, they may have had it for the Atari 800 as well. And I've been wanting one of these for a while now uh, because I do have a fascination with uh, imaging technology from the early 8-bit computing days. All right, and there it is. This is the VersaWriter. And yeah, it's pretty, uh, the board's not very thick. You know, it's always funny how you see things in pictures and you visualize them being a certain way and then they, uh, you actually get them in your hand. It's like, whoa, that's uh, not as big as I was thinking it was or not as big and heavy as I thought it was. Looks like our serial number is 3049. So this is probably a little bit later in production. But yeah, this is uh, definitely an historic board because this is what Ken Williams used to digitize the graphics for what I believe is the first graphical adventure game ever, which was Mystery House and for what became online systems and then later Sierra. And you can see this is a little less friendly than the digital paintbrush that I showed in a previous video. It's a lot more primitive. It was kind of designed more for basically digitizing things like pie charts and, and stuff like that. It's not the friendliest device to work with. Uh, and you, it's not really something you can freehand with either. Now there were more capable graphics tablets available. Um, Apple had one that had an actual pen, but Ken decided to go with this one because it was half the price. I think this was $200 versus $400 for the Apple graphics tablet. And you know, he just wasn't sure that this whole, you know, video game thing would become a thing. And yeah, he just wasn't willing to invest, um, you know, $400 a device to do it so he went with this he didn't like the tools apparently um didn't think that they were uh, up to snuff for what he was trying to do so he actually developed his own tools and then he also solved another problem that he had in doing that because apple II discs didn't have a lot of storage space and of course if you were creating all these images uh, you would fill up disk space very quickly what he did was he actually borrowed uh, a leaf from a video text basically and instructed the software to basically record his hand motions as the image was being uh, digitized. And so instead of sending the image, which takes up a lot of space, you send essentially like a script along and then the computer on the other side just redraws whatever image you wanted it to draw. So when you're looking at some of these old games, you can actually see how it's sort of tracing it out on the screen. It does it very quickly, obviously. But what you're witnessing are the actual hand movements of somebody, you know, 30 plus years ago, tracing it into the computer. I can't even begin to imagine the patience that it would have taken to do that with something like this. <laughs> Cause uh, 
yeah, I mean, your ability to move is, I mean, it's really questionable. So yeah, basically what you do is you'd get a drawing like this one and you basically just pull the arm off, you shove it under here and then, yeah, you would just sit there and basically trace that around like that. Oh, man, you would have had to have a lot of patience and dexterity to get it right. I don't know if his software, you know, had some forgiveness built in, like he could stop if he made a mistake. You can see places on the original image. This is just a print off I did of a screenshot. Um, but you can see basically where there's just these little edges here and there where they just kind of went off because, you know, they just couldn't get it perfect with this thing and they just decided to leave it like that. Yeah, thinking about this and how tricky this device is to operate by comparison to something with a pen, um, I'm quite impressed with these graphics now in a way I wasn't before. So yeah, that's uh, an historic tablet for the Apple II, the first writer. I will be doing a video on this uh, at some point in the near future and we can check out what it does. Unfortunately, Ken Williams' original tools seem to be lost. Uh, he apparently made them commercially available for other uh, programmers, but for whatever reason, uh, there's no copies that we know of that survive. Okay, here is one that has been incredibly high on my collecting list for years. They don't come up very often for sale, and when they do, they usually go for huge dollars. I didn't do too badly on this one. It's actually missing the disk drive unit that normally sits on top, but you know what? I'll take whatever form I can get this machine in because they just, they just don't come up. I think you see maybe like one a year if you're lucky. So yeah, this is basically an Albert. It is a clone of the Apple II, and it's a little bit different than your standard Apple II clone, mainly because uh, it has some enhanced capabilities. It can do, I think, up to 256 colors, which is quite an improvement on the Apple II, and it has RGB output and the whole bit. It could run on a battery, believe it or not. And yeah, if we open it up here, the lid off. Make sure the camera can see. So that's the innards. So it doesn't look like your standard Apple II, does it? They, it does have Apple II compatible expansion slots up here, but yeah, everything's kind of oriented differently uh, than a standard Apple II. This machine also, I believe, has a Z80 processor incorporated alongside the 6502, so it can run CPM more or less natively. And yeah, the story on the Albert is kind of uh, interesting. It's uh, one mostly of woe. Uh, basically, these guys got sued big time by Apple. But they also had a lot of technical problems with this machine, and especially the power supply, which was known to be quite anemic and very easy to, to blow up. I think this puts out about 30 something volts DC. It plugs into the back here. You can see right there, you also got a plug in for external battery, external speaker. That 30 volts is regulated down to whatever the computer needs with that board there. I don't know if the weak point is this voltage regulator board or the actual power supply. I've heard it's the actual power supply. Um, and you can see this machine is kind of ad hoc. There's a lot of bodge wires going around everywhere. We've got the uh, crystal directly soldered to this chip. There weren't very many of these made. They were just kind of getting into production uh, when the company basically went bankrupt uh, between the lawsuit and all the problems with uh, the power supplies and machines getting returned. And there is a legend that one of the engineers that worked on this machine actually programmed in some sabotage to one of the EEPROMs for the disk drive and basically designed it to basically destroy the disk drive after a certain date. Apparently he was disgruntled. I don't know why. Maybe he never got paid or something. But yeah, this one I think is a fairly early example. Um, you know, it doesn't even have a serial number on it. It's quite typical of Albert. Everything with Albert is just messy just because the company was a mess. Um, but you can see overall, I mean, it looked like they were going for a pretty nice machine. You've got a lot of ports on the back here. You got composite video, you got RGB, you got your joystick plug in there, networking options there. You got a printer port, uh, which is just a standard serial 
parallel port. You've got a lot of things built into this that you typically had to add on to an Apple II. So I, I think that was kind of the, the value proposition that they were uh, going for there. Um, these machines typically would have come with their own uh, disc controller card. I've just got my uh, disc two controller because I was trying to see if I could get the thing to boot. Um, it doesn't have Apple Basic and ROM. This was the way that they were trying to avoid Apple's legal team. And so you need a special disc to boot it. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting story and I definitely am gonna do a full video on this machine when I get a chance. This one does work. It actually turns on to an Albert prompt. So I know it's good um, for now until this thing decides to grenade. But yeah, you can look forward to getting in depth with this thing sometime in the future.